Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, sure glad that you are with us and uh, glad to have the opportunity uh, to study together this morning. Uh, open your Bibles to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Uh, it is a wonderful psalm of praise and honor, and it's just really uh, a refreshing encouragement for us uh, to look at this morning. Uh, so we'll do that together after we pray. God, thanks for the morning. Thanks for uh, our opportunity to be together uh, today. Thank you for this study of your word. Uh, we pray that as we learn uh, today that our hearts would be encouraged, uh, that our minds would be built up in knowledge, that we would reflect on how good you are a good, perfect, and loving Father. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ. We give thanks for your Word and the testimony of those eyewitnesses who saw Him, who knew Him, who saw Him ascend into heaven. We give thanks for their Word being communicated to us so that our faith can rest on things that are true and uh, on things that are fact. We give thanks for that, and as we worship today, as we consider this great psalm of praise, we give thanks to you for making it possible, and it's through Christ's name that we pray, amen. So here is uh, verse number one uh, of this tremendous psalm. Uh, let's read through verse three. It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. Uh, what a refreshing thing it is for us to be in a spot where we are giving praise. This is a Sabbath day meditation. And it is to proclaim, according to verse 2, to proclaim the Lord's steadfast love uh, and his abounding faithfulness. And this is a, a reading from Psalm 89, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, it says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever and that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The psalmist here in Psalm 92 wants to proclaim God's faithfulness and his love. And uh, that is agreed in Lamentations, for example, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. The scripture says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that's what the psalmist is bringing to our attention, is God's love and his faithfulness. And specifically, uh, according to verse 4, this is what he brings along uh, for us. He says, For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord, I will sing for the joy of what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. And he brings to, to our attention this idea of making the deeds of God known. And this is a great thing for us to think about. The psalmist says in Psalm 64 and verse 10, Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart praise him. God's deeds are praise worthy. In Psalm 106, uh, this is what the psalmist says in verses 47 and 48. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, let all the people say, Amen. 
praise the Lord. And the psalmist is praising God for his wonderful works. Psalm 126, for example, and verse 3 says, The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy as a result. In Psalm 145, verses 6 and 7, the scripture says, They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. It's God's deeds that are in the focus, and so many of the Psalms bring our attention to God's deeds. Knowing what God has done uh, puts us in a spot where uh, we can consider his, uh, his works and uh, also his thoughts. This is uh, Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 8, where Isaiah says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. When Isaiah is speaking that word, he's trying to impress the distance between our being here on the earth and the heavens above. And whatever distance that represents to our eye, to our mind, that's the distance between our thoughts and God's thoughts. And the psalmist here in Psalm 92 wants us to think about how great the works of God are. But in connection to the works of God are, are this, uh, is this idea that uh, the thoughts of God are in connection to his works. You have made me glad by your deeds. Check how God has been working in your life, and you will see a reason why you should celebrate. Uh, let's do verses 6 and 7. The senseless man does not know. Fools do not understand that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will forever be destroyed. When you think about uh, looking at foolish people. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 14 and verse 1, he said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, Psalm 94 in verse 8 reads this way, take heed, you senseless ones among the people, you fools. When will you become wise. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3 says this, the ox knows his master, the donkey knows his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people don't understand. There are always going to be people who represent the fool's disposition or the foolish side of things. Those people do not understand. But verse 7 says that though the wicked spring up like grass, they will all be destroyed. As a matter of fact, David makes mention of this in Psalm 37, verses 1 and 2, where he says, Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 and 7 says this, A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? Here's what was responded. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are like grass. James chapter 1, for example, speaks of this uh, simplicity of evildoers. Uh, the rich, he says, uh, should take pride in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. He says the rich should take pride in his low position, 
because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls, its beauty is destroyed in the same way. The rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. There is no evildoer, there is no one who is against God that is going to stand against God. And those that are against God that are evildoers, they're going to be destroyed. And the reason is verse 8 says this, but you, O Lord, are enthroned or exalted forever. That's the point of the psalm, is God is worthy of praise. His enemies will not be able to touch him. Those who are faithless, he will destroy. Those who are wicked, he will destroy. But God is exalted and remains uh, exalted forever. Uh, Psalm 83 and verse 18 says, Let them know that you, whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Psalm 102 says this, They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same. Your years will never end. Speaking about God's glory. Daniel saw, uh, or the Nebuchadnezzar uh, saw God restoring his sanity. And in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 and 35, he says, At the end of my time, I raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. Listen to this great king. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the power of heaven and the people of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is exalted. And that's why, according to verse 9, uh, the enemies of the Lord will surely perish. In Psalm 21, verses 8 and 9, for example, the scripture says, Your hand will lay hold of all your enemies. Your right hand will seize all your foes. At the time of your appearing, you will make them a fiery furnace. In his wrath, the Lord will swallow them up, and his fire will consume them. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 27, Jesus is teaching and talking about a, a parable that marks his rejection. And in Luke 19, for example... Uh, in verse 26, you'll remember, he said these words, I tell you the truth, uh, everyone, I tell you that everyone who has said, who has, will be given more, and the one who has nothing, even what he has, will be taken. But those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. These evildoers, these men who are against God will ultimately be destroyed. Verse 10 and 11, you get this idea. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured on me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have uh, heard the rout of my wicked foes. Oh, you exalt my horn like that of a wild ox. Psalm 89 and verse 17 gives a little bit of indication uh, re related to this idea of a horn connected to strength. And that's what he's trying to say. Uh, in Psalm 89, for example, in verse 17, the scripture says, For you are the glory and strength. And by your favor, you exalt our horn. The horn is a detail of glory and strength. In Psalm 112, for example, in verse 9, 
uh, the scripture says, He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be lifted high in honor. The psalmist here in 92 is saying, You have lifted, you have given me that strength like that of a wild uh, Wow, that is an impressive picture, and uh, it makes you aware of how serious it is to think about being against a force where someone is empowered by God. For example, uh, Psalm 37 and verse 4 says, Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. The picture is of God's protection. Psalm 91 and verse 8, listen carefully. Psalm 91 and verse 8 says, You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. The point is that it won't touch you. The psalmist knows that there will be enemies, but those enemies will be ultimately destroyed, and God is going to be standing against them. As you move into verse 12, uh, the scripture says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of of our God. They will bear fruit in old age and stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. What a great, great, encouraging word. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Wow. Uh, this is Psalm 52. In verse 8, the psalmist says, But I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. This is Hosea. Oh, what a great book of encouragement. Hosea chapter 14, beginning in verse 5 and 6, Hosea says, I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like that of an olive tree. His fragrance like that of a cedar of Lebanon. And God was trying to give a promise of what he would do on the other side of his wrath, on the other side of his punishment, on the side of uh, bringing people back from exile, and helping them to overcome uh, their sin. Psalm 104 and verse 16 says this, The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. What a great picture. The righteous will look like trees that are planted by God himself, like a cedar of Lebanon. Mm, what a great, great place. Planted in the house of the Lord. Uh, this is uh, from Saul, I'm sorry, this is from Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, in verse 3, where the scripture says, And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Now listen. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. For the display of his splendor. A tree planted in the house of the Lord is treated very well. It's given all God's precious attention. 
it is not just going to survive. It's going to thrive. It's going to flourish. It's going to grow. It's going to produce. So that even this promise is given to verse number 14. They will still bear fruit in their old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and in him there is no wickedness. This is a great little stretch from Job chapter 17. And it says this in verse 9. Nevertheless, the righteous will hold to their ways, and those with clean hands will grow stronger. Well, that's a great encouraging verse. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Along a path of wisdom from the writer uh, of uh, you know Solomon trying to give wisdom. This is wisdom talking. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn. You know what that looks like when you look out of your bedroom window and it's before daylight has happened and you can just get the first glimpse before dawn. But then the, the writer says this in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. The picture is that as we begin our walk with God in a way of wisdom, it's comparatively to the gleam of dawn, that uh, sort of mysterious looking, it's not dark, but it's certainly not light, but it ends in the full light of day. That's the proclamation here, is that God will keep you right in that spot where you are living for him, they will still bear fruit in old age, fresh and green. And they proclaim, oh, what a great thing. They proclaim that the Lord is upright. Mm. Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 62 and verse 6. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. In a psalm where, or in a song, uh, it's not in the Psalms, but in a song, in a blessing uh, there of Moses as he is uh, writing at the end of his life, he says about God in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4, He is the rock. His words are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he from Psalm 145 and verse 17 the Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 5 the Lord within her is righteous he does no wrong morning by morning he dispenses his justice, and every day he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. Romans chapter 9 and verse 14. Paul asks this question, what shall we say? Is God unjust? And his answer is this, not at all. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 6, Paul says, God is 
just. Listen to the comfort. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. And this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, bringing vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. You see the distinction? Those who are the righteous, they're going to flourish. Those who are right with God, who are uh, attended by the husband, the, uh, the, the, the vine tender, the garden tender, when God is in control and he is pruning, he is taking care of his tree, he knows how to make it fruitful. And for its duration, it will remain fruitful. And he can make it so that someone in their old age can proclaim, the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no wickedness in him. That is for us a great sense of strength and a great source of comfort. Because we face all kinds of various things that try us, that test us, that challenge us. But this one thing is unmoved. The righteous will flourish. God will take care of them. He is seeing over them because they are proclaiming his wonderful deeds. And today, as we gather together for worship, I am praying that you would take this meditation, this word from the psalmist, and think about these things as we worship God together. It is such a delight to know that we are children of God, and there are so many promises that accompany the life of those who live in honor and fear of God. And this is just one of those great promises. The righteous will flourish like a palm. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord, in the company of and the presence, and the care, and the provision, and the power, and the strength, and the protection of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. Enjoy the psalm. Uh, thanks for studying with me this morning. Appreciate everybody being with me.